All right, so turn to Matthew chapter 10. As we saw last time, Jesus has commissioned his 12 apostles to go throughout Israel to proclaim to their fellow Jews that the king of the kingdom is at hand. In other words, let the people know that Jesus is the king. He is in their midst and to prove uh, to all their fellow Jews that Jesus is their long-awaited Messiah. Jesus gives these 12 men his power, his authority to do all these amazing uh, signs and wonders. Look at verse 8 in chapter 10. He says this is what he's going to give them authority to do. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And that's a good principle for all of us to remember. Uh, whatever the Lord has given you by his grace, whatever he has entrusted to you, use it for God's glory by blessing other people around you and telling them about Jesus. Now, we also saw that this was a special power that he gave them, exousia, power. That's what it means, authority. It refers to God's authority over the physical realm. That's why they're doing these signs and wonders over the demonic realm. Now, this is only a temporary empowering that he gave these 12 apostles. Remember that even Judas Iscariot had this exousia power given to him for this short-term ministry. It took about three months to send him out throughout Israel, and they'd go from town to town, village to village, city to city. But as we've seen, the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis power, is only given you know, after Pentecost. It's given on the day of Pentecost to all believers who come to Christ, who receive Him as their Lord and Savior. So it's only for genuine believers that receive the dunamis power of the Spirit, the sealing of the power of the Holy Spirit within our lives. Judas Iscariot did not experience that because he was never saved. This is why Jesus calls him the son of perdition or the son of destruction. So it would be on the day of Pentecost that 120 disciples, including 11 of these apostles, were filled up and powered by the Holy Spirit just as Jesus promised them. So the rest of this chapter in chapter 10 deals with Jesus giving uh, these 12 guys very important lessons, very important instructions, and a lot of warnings concerning what they will encounter as they go throughout Israel. Some of these they would experience on this particular journey that he sends them on. Some of these instructions they would not experience until after Pentecost. And some of these experiences that he tells them will take place as they take the gospel throughout the world. Now, for you and me today, there are certainly a lot of principles in this chapter that are valid for all Christians of all ages, all times, especially in hostile areas of the world that are not open to the good news of Jesus. And we're seeing that more and more in our country, so take note. Verse 16 is where we pick up. Behold, Jesus says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This is one of the most famous verses in the Gospel of Matthew, also one of the most important. First of all, it's a good thing that Jesus is on our side because this world is filled with wolves that would love to chew us up and spit out the bones. So he says, be wise. What's the wisest thing you and I can do as we live in this world? Stay close to Jesus. That's simple. Stay close to the Lord. Now, to be harmless, he says, that means to be innocent. In other words, don't give the enemy reason to come against you, to persecute you. He'll do it anyway, but don't give him any reasons because you're living unholy, unrighteous lives. Don't forget we are to be ambassadors for Christ. We are representing Jesus to a lost, dying world around us. Jesus has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He has not given us the ministry of destruction. Now, we're all familiar with 2 Corinthians 5.17, but the verses that follow are very, very important. Look at these verses, 2 Corinthians 5.17, starting, uh, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
And he goes on to say, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What is reconciliation? It simply means to bring two opposing parties, two opposing people, together into an agreement. In the biblical context, it means to bring an enemy of God into a right relationship with God. And so as an ambassador for Christ, we represent Jesus. We represent His glorious kingdom to a world that is in rebellion against the Lord. That's why Jesus calls them wolves. But the amazing power of the gospel is he can change any wolf, like I was, into a sheep. Only he can do that. He makes you a new creation in Christ. No longer wolves out to destroy, but now you are a sheep. You are following the chief shepherd, Jesus. So that's why we don't go around today burning up, you know, buildings, burning down buildings, blowing up, you know, places. That's why we don't put a sword to someone's neck, tell them to convert to Christianity or die. That's not the Jesus style of ministry. Again, a sheep in the midst of wolves, the only way we can be safe is to stay close to the chief shepherd. He's got the staff that drives the wolves away. He has the, the authority, the power, to keep us from becoming lamb chops. Wolves have no power over Jesus. And again, we are in Christ, and because we are in Christ, we are safe and secure in His hands. So look at verse 17. He says, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. But uh, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So this is looking into the future. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now, one of the ways we know that Jesus is speaking of future events is that many of these things did not happen until after Pentecost. Peter's a great example of this. Before Pentecost, he was frightened. He was hiding out. He was very timid. He denied knowing the Lord three times. But after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon Peter, he stood before multitudes of people there in Jerusalem, preaches the gospel, and 3,000 people get saved. Later, when he and John were arrested by the religious leaders, they you know, were proclaiming the gospel throughout you know, Jerusalem, and they were arrested, they were threatened by the leaders, they were let go, they kept preaching the gospel, they got re-arrested, they were beaten the second time, they told uh, Peter and John, stop speaking and preaching in that name, and this is what Peter said in Acts 5.29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And that is still a principle for us today. So the Holy Spirit gave those early disciples great confidence in Jesus being with them and great boldness to proclaim the gospel to those around them. In Acts chapter 7, we see one of the first deacons, Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gives us one of the great sermons in the New Testament. But at the, at the end of it all, they end up stoning Stephen to death. And yet, as he is being put to death, he sees Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, actually standing at the right hand of the Father. And uh, a glorious thing that he was not afraid. But just like Jesus says here, when they deliver you up, don't worry about what you're going to speak. When they deliver you up, don't worry because the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to say at the right moment. That'll happen numerous times to the Apostle Paul as well. We see him over and over again standing before leaders, standing before authorities. Uh, he'll even stand before Caesar Nero 
and testify of Jesus Christ. That has been the case for the last 2,000 years. He'll give you boldness to speak the truth of God's Word when you need it most. So you don't have to worry, he says. If somebody arrested you because of your faith and, and you're standing before them, the Holy Spirit will empower you at that moment to share the truth and love. And then you leave it in God's hands. What happens? With these guys, many times they got beat up, sent away. Many times they were locked up, but the Lord was faithful. So look at verse 21, Matthew chapter 10. A brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And so these are very sobering words that God has used to encourage and used to sustain millions upon millions of Christians over the last 2,000 years. This is very important. Millions of Christians have suffered and died. Millions of Christians have been beaten and imprisoned for the name of Jesus Christ. It looks like it's getting closer to being a reality in our nation as well. But the, again, the point is hang in there with the Lord. People will come against you. People will become more and more dark, but we're to be more and more uh, reflecting the light of Christ. And he says here, hang in there. When you hang in there, when you're going through trials and persecution, it simply shows by your perseverance that you're a genuine Christian. You don't get saved because you get martyred or get beaten up. That doesn't save you. You're saved by faith alone and Christ alone. But that shows that you're genuine when you stand before others and commit to Jesus, what happens, whatever happens. Well, look at verse 23. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So here he's specifically speaking to these 12 apostles, and he wants them to keep moving, keep telling people that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If they don't want to listen to you, he says, keep moving. Because the Son of Man is coming right behind you. He's going, and that's what Jesus does. After he sends them out, he goes to these cities and he proclaims the truth of who he is. And so he says, I'll follow you throughout Israel. Verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, lord of the flies, demonic, how much more will they call those of his household? You know, the goal of every one of us as Christians should be, I want to be more like Jesus. Now, in many ways, that's a two-sided coin. On the one side, we want to be more loving and gracious. We want to be a blessing to other people around us. We want to help and encourage and lift people up from their dire circumstances in life. But also know this, on the other side of that same coin, we see Jesus mocked and ridiculed. We'll see him beaten and tortured and nailed to the cross. He was hated and despised by others. In fact, on the night before his crucifixion, this is what Jesus tells his disciples. Look at the, these verses in John 15. Do you have this one on your refrigerator? Need a little pick-me-up? Promise? Positive confession, here you go. John, I'm being facetious. John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, <laughs> you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And, and so we disciples of Jesus, we're not above our master. So don't think, oh, I'm, I'm immune from persecution. Paul says, you know, that whoever desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's another positive confession. Well, look at verse 26. Therefore, do not fear them. 
Don't fear the world, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. This is the first of four times Jesus uses the word fear in this chapter. Now, this is very applicable to what we're experiencing in the world all around us today. The news is pushing fear. The government is pushing fear. But here we see that fear should not be the driving force in our lives. Jesus wants us to walk by faith and not by fear. He wants us to keep our focus on Him. He wants us to walk in love, not in fear. Look at these verses in 1 John 4, verse 4. It says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So Jesus in us is much greater, infinitely greater than the enemy out in the world. A few verses later in 1 John 4, 18, John writes, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now listen, as believers and followers of Jesus, we know where all this craziness of the world is going. The Bible is clear what's going to happen in the last days. I don't like the way things are going, but it's inevitable. It's prophesied about in the scriptures. Men's hearts are going from bad to worse. We're racing toward a one-world economy. We're racing toward a one-world religion. We're, we're seeing apostasy in churches all around us. The mark of the beast can be implemented very quickly. No one will be able to buy or sell with, unless they take the mark of the beast. And we're being programmed, not we, because we won't be here when that happens, but people are being programmed to accept whatever the government tells you. This is why people like Jan Markell and Jack Hibbs and J.D. Farag and, uh, you know, Amir Sarfati and others, they, they like to say that we're living in the times of the signs. Not signs of the time, but we're living in the times of the signs. In other words, everything is falling into place. Once the rapture happens and all of us are caught up into the presence of the Lord, you know, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ, all who have died previously, will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. And as soon as we're escorted up into glory with Jesus, the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 18, will quickly come to pass. That's when the Antichrist is revealed. That's when he implements the mark of the beast. Uh, wars will quickly break out, but the worst of all will be the unleashing of God's wrath and judgment on planet Earth upon all those who rebelled against the Lord. And it'll be on the brink of annihilation. It'll be so horrendous during the Great Tribulation that Jesus tells us this, Matthew 24, verse 22, that unless those days were shortened, and he's referring to the Great Tribulation, wars, judgments from God, World War III, Armageddon breaking out, and all those things. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, that's the Jews, those days will be shortened. And how are those days shortened? By the second coming of Jesus Christ. You can read all about it. Matthew 19, or Matthew, Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, Jesus Opens, you know, heaven is open. He comes back riding on a white horse. All those who are clothed in fine linen, and white and clean, which is the righteous acts of the saints, you and me are following him, riding on white horses. He comes back to earth, wipes out of all, all of God's enemies, and he'll establish the kingdom of God that will last for a thousand years. So when you know how it all ends, that should alleviate a lot of the present day fears and anxiety. So Jesus is telling us, he's telling them and us, that we don't need to fear the leaders around us. We don't need to fear the government. We don't need to fear those behind the scenes pulling the strings of our president. We don't need to fear the mob rule mentality. We don't need to fear different doctors out there. We just need to keep proclaiming the truth of God's word. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. That's our primary job. Not to worry about everything going on around us, but to get the name of Jesus 
out there, the gospel that saves. Listen, nobody, and I mean nobody, according to these verses, is doing anything that God does not see. He will reveal it, and what he sees, he will judge. You know, it looks like presently powerful people behind the scenes are getting away with stuff that we find offensive and evil and wrong, and it is. But a day is coming when all those who are left behind that don't turn to Christ, all of them will stand before the great white throne judgment. That is sentencing day for the lake of fire, Gehenna, that burns forever. And they'll be sentenced for their sin and rebellion against God. That's the ultimate destruction of their souls. So look at verse 28. He says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him, God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So here Jesus gives us this huge contrast between fearing man and fearing God. As believers, we don't have to fear what man can do to us, because the worst that man can do to you is kill you physically. But guess what? That's the greatest blessing of all because you get promoted instantly. That's why we don't fear death. I'm not looking forward to the process. I've always thought that'd be bad to get eaten by a shark. I'm not looking, you know, I wouldn't want that. But, you know, fear death because we know where we're going. I mean, we get to go to heaven and be with Jesus. That's the greatest promotion of all. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul says, We are confident... I hope you have that confidence. Yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul says, I'm caught between the two. When you read in Philippians 1, verses 21 and 22 in that range, he talks about, I'm kind of caught between the two. I'd like to go home to be with the Lord. Right now it's needful for me to stay here, but that which I want to do, is I don't know. I'm just looking forward to seeing Jesus. But in the meantime, he says, to live is Christ." To die is gain. There's no gain if you soul sleep. There's gain if you go to the presence of the Lord. So we are going to be absent from this body someday and we'll be present with the Lord. Having that blessed assurance of knowing where we're going when we die is probably the number one reason we can walk by faith and have confidence in the Lord instead of fearing all the craziness of the world around us. There's an unhealthy fear of man, so we don't want to have that unhealthy fear of man, but there's also a healthy fear of God. The fear of the Lord means we have this reverential awe of God. It's not that we're like timid, afraid of God, but no, we have this reverential awe of who He is, the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's great respect for our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Proverbs 9, verse 10 it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It's only when a person sees their need for God. They, they recognize, I am a sinner, and I deserve to be punished for my sins. Unless my sins are washed away and forgiven, I'll be separated from God forever in the lake of fire. That's a good fear to have because then you see the good news is Jesus provides eternal life for anyone who will come to him by faith. That's why we are to be about sharing that gospel message with the lost. Jesus came to take their sins upon himself. He shed his blood so that they could be forgiven of all sin. They could be saved for all of eternity. Uh, Again, that's God's perfect love, and it casts out all fear when we walk in it. So, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? That literally means the lowest, tiniest coin in Israel at that time. And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And some of us are making it easy to count. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And so here he's reassuring his disciples of the father's great love for them. In other words, sparrows, they're sold for next to nothing. But even the Father knows when one of those sparrows dies. The point is, if God knows about the little sparrows, 
Don't you think he knows everything about you and that he cares for you? That's his point here. The most amazing thing is God loves you infinitely more than any birds of the air, any beast in the field, any fish in the ocean. I mean, you alone are created in the image and likeness of God. He's a triune being, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He created us with a body, a soul, intellect, and a spirit, pneuma, which only comes to life when we're born again. So we don't have to fear needlessly. What can man do to you? God loves you. He cares for you. So keep yourself in his love, in his care. Verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, these are very interesting verses. Uh, confession simply means to agree with. In other words, we are agreeing with God. 1 John 1.9 it says, if we confess our sins, we agree with God, yes, Lord, I just sinned, that is sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Romans 10, verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, you're agreeing with God that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So when you put it all together, it simply means that I'm agreeing with God that I'm a sinner. I'm agreeing with God what I deserve for my sins. But I'm agreeing with God that Jesus is the Lord and Savior, and that He died on that cross. He shed His blood for me, for my sins. Yes, for the sins of the world, but for me, I agree with God. He alone can forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And since he rose from the dead, I agree with God that he has given me everlasting life. When you receive him, you are born again, and you have eternal life. So we agree with him. Yes, your word is true. Our confession of faith in Christ is simply lived out in our day-to-day -day relationship with the Lord. In other words, we're not ashamed to be identified as followers of Christ. It's more than just being able to say it with your mouth. It's also living out your life for Jesus. To confess Him before others means much more than just making a statement with our lips, but also means that we're willing to back up our statement with our life, with our lifestyle. You know, it's one thing to say, Jesus is Lord, but it's another thing to surrender our lives to Him moment by moment because we don't want to just talk the talk. We want to walk the walk. We want to walk in faith and trust in Him. At the same time, don't let Satan condemn you when you stumble and fall, which we all do. You know, don't, you know, we might, you know, people say, well, you just denied the Lord. You just said something bad. You had a bad thought. You did something wrong. Well, guess what? Every single person in the world that is born again does. Only one person is perfect, and that's Jesus. And also remember that when we do mess up, when we do miss an opportunity to be a good witness for Christ, don't forget Jesus is our advocate. 1 John 2, verse 1. You know, when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It says he is interceding on our behalf. In other words, Jesus is confessing us before the Father. He's saying, you know, Father, this one belongs to us. I paid the price to redeem that person. I, I bought them off the slave market of sin. They are clean. They're forgiven. They're sanctified and justified. Remember Philippians 1.6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the day when we will be glorified in his presence. He started it. He will finish it. We're just going along for the ride. By faith, we're trusting him to do it all. At the same time, Jesus says, whoever denies me before men... Him I also will deny before my Father in heaven. This is important to understand in its context because Jesus is not talking about a born-again Christian who stumbles and falls in some way. 
Otherwise, again, we would all be denied by the Lord. Otherwise, Peter certainly would not have found forgiveness after he denied the Lord three times. cock a doodle do, remember? But this refers to the make-believers, those who call themselves Christians, but they've never confessed Jesus as Lord with their lips, with their heart, with their life. This is what Jesus talked about. We looked at this in great detail in Matthew 7, remember? Verse 21 to 23, this is where Jesus says, Not everyone who says, so it's not just saying the words, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So the ones who Jesus denies before the Father are those who do not have a genuine relationship with the Lord. A simple way to know if you do is to ask yourself, am I seeking to glorify God or am I seeking to glorify myself? Am I living for the Lord or am I living for myself? Have I trusted in Jesus alone for my salvation or am I trusting in my own goodness, my own works? Is that going to save me? It's not rocket science. It's like Paul telling the Philippian jailer who says, What must I do to be saved? Remember what he tells him? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe. It's active. It doesn't just mean have intellectual thought because the demons believe. They know who Jesus is. And yet they tremble. But it means to put your faith and trust in Him alone for your salvation. It's that simple. Trust Him. Give your life to Him. John 1.12 says, But as many as received Him, if you really believe Him, you're going to receive Him as your Lord and Savior. To them He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in His name. So, verse 34, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Oh, really? Come on, that's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Again, this is definitely a two-edged sword. On one side, Jesus came to bring the ultimate peace into this world by reconciling us to the Father. When we give our lives to the Lord, we are brought into a relationship, into peace with God. We were, used to be enemies of God, but now we've surrendered to Jesus. You surrender your life. You've lost the battle. You realize, I can't fight this. I surrender to you, Lord. And now there is peace in our lives. We go from being enemies of God to being at peace and rest with the Lord. But on the other side of that sword, there's division. And that's because that sword is the Word of God. That sword is absolute truth. And that sword, God's word, is what divides people in this world. There's so many that say, I don't believe what this says. Well, they're still, you know, at battle against the Lord. Many of us can relate to this. Many of us can testify of this. There are a lot of people around us, family members and friends alike, that are antagonistic when it comes to the clear teachings of the Bible. I've had relatives say, well, you can't, you know, tell me this lifestyle is sin. Why can't you tolerate my lifestyle? I said, well, the Bible says, I don't want to hear the Bible. You're just narrow-minded. I'm sorry. This is what Jesus says. He came to bring division. Look at verse 35. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Many of us have experienced this firsthand, especially when we got saved. My parents, especially my dad, was very upset when I told him I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He thought I went off the deep end. He accused me of trying to be you know, you're just thinking you're more righteous than I am. You know, that's not right. You know, now you have to hate my, you know, your, your parents. And I'm like, what do you mean I got to hate you? That, that doesn't make any sense. I, I don't hate you. I just want to see you saved. I want to see you and mom come to the Lord. And you know what his response was? Verse 37. 
It shocked me. I'm a baby Christian. He says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Well, actually, my dad didn't quote this verse. He actually quoted a stronger verse. It's in Luke chapter 14, <laughs> verse 26. Look at this verse. Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does, and this is what my dad quoted, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, he didn't understand what that meant, neither did I, he cannot be my disciple. That's when my dad said, Well, if that's the God you follow who says you have to hate me, then I don't want anything to do with that God. Well, I was shocked. You know, I was also shocked not only by what my dad said, I was shocked by what Jesus said. I'd never heard that. What do you mean? You got hate. I didn't know that, Lord. You you love me. That's why I got saved. I heard that you love me. You died for me. You shed your blood for me on the cross. I didn't understand that. And so it was the next night I went to a home fellowship, and I asked the leader about that verse in Luke 14. And what I came to understand is that we look at hate and love as opposites in our culture. In the Jewish culture, they look at it as a comparative term. There's a big difference. We look at it as opposites. Oh, you either love them or you hate them. That's not how it looks in the Eastern, Far Eastern culture, or the Middle Eastern culture. Jesus was simply saying that our love for him should be so great, so strong, that... Our love for others looks like hate in comparison. You understand that? It doesn't mean we hate our parents. No, it means it looks like hate in comparison to how much we should be loving God. Remember, Jesus tells, tells us the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no hate in that, but it's that comparative thing. Our love for Jesus must be supreme. We've already seen Jesus telling us back in chapters 5 and 6, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. If Jesus isn't number one in our lives, then whoever comes before Jesus is what? An idol. That's the comparison. So we need to love Jesus first and foremost with all of our hearts. I tried to explain that to my dad later once I figured out what it was talking about. He didn't want to hear it. But be that as it may, verse 38, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So again, if we really want to find your life... If you really want to know what life is all about, you lose it. In other words, you give it to Jesus. You, you, your life goes into His life. His life comes into your life. And only then will you find true meaning and purpose. This is what Paul says about this in Galatians 2, verse 20, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's what he's referring to here. We need to lose our life in Christ, and then we find our life only as we are in Christ. Then you know what life is all about. I am righteous. Not because I'm righteous, but Jesus has given me his righteousness. I'm forgiven doesn't matter what I think, it's because He has forgiven me. So you find your actual life, your new life, in Christ, where the old things pass away, behold, all things become new. Verse 40, He receives you, receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So when you share with others the good news of Jesus, and they receive what you have to say, they're receiving Jesus. By receiving Jesus, they're receiving the Father. He who honors the Father honors the Son. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That's spoken in John. It's also given in 1 John. That's why cults are not saved, because they dishonor Jesus. You have to honor him for who he is, the Son of God, God the Son, co-creator of the heavens and the earth. If you dishonor him 
Like some people will say, oh, no, he's just a created being. He's Michael the Archangel. No, he's not. That's dishonoring who Jesus is. And by dishonoring him, you're dishonoring the Father. But when you receive the true Jesus of the Word of God, then you receive the Father as well. So a lot of people say, oh, I believe in Jesus. But again, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of God. Those who truly understand believe in the Jesus of the Bible, not a man-made Jesus. Verse 41, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. And so again, after telling the disciples how rough it's going to be out there in the world, he closes this section by telling them once again, they are his ambassadors, his representatives, and what may seem like the hardest job in the world to go out in the world and tell people about Jesus, it's actually the greatest privilege in this life. Because when someone receives your message, they're going to get saved. They're going to receive him as Lord and Savior. And we're going to see that brother, that sister in glory for eternity. That's what makes it worth it. That's what makes it all worth it. And there's no greater reward than seeing people brought out of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God and receive eternal life. It makes all the trials, all the struggles worth every tear, worth every drop of blood to see people who are dead in their sins brought to life and then just seeing them in heaven will give us great joy. And that's the greatest reward that will last throughout eternity. Paul says, that's my crown of rejoicing to see these people brought into glory. That's what he tells the Thessalonians. To see you in heaven after he led them to Christ. What a reward that is.